happy uh, to see you all for the second lecture this uh, semester. Uh, a few things. Uh, we will, as we did uh, last time, have a little drink outside, uh, which is, I don't know, it just feels like such a victory. So I want to start with that. Um, and uh, of course, tonight, it's really, it's actually really great to talk about this subject, architecture and robotics. And um, we always were the school that was interested in design research and in making. Design research as in not separating research from design and making is obvious, but making has changed. Um, Somewhere in 2015, Marilyn Taylor asked me to um, start something called a robotic lab. We had no space and we had no robots. So it was literally start the robotic lab from scratch. Um, and we did that by, by just starting a research lab called the Advanced Research and Innovation Lab. Uh, that as its first mission got to make a robotic lab. So the, that was a, a long summer. Uh, Andrew Saunders and I interviewed uh, KUKA, ABB and Stabli and uh, figured out that ABB had an amazing research center right here in Pennsylvania, seemed the most uh, interested, the most um, advanced and we went ahead and um, started thinking of buying robots. If initially one, then we realized, you know, one is nothing, so we got two robots. Um, and essentially, we also managed to deprogram the whole side of um, this building, as you know, on the ground floor, uh, which um, is one of the jobs I do. I will spare you the long-winded uh, meetings we had over that, but it happened. And then, of course, now you see how they are cutting here, um, which then results in these amazing complex shapes. And what is really beautiful about that is many things, but um, I'm not showing at all work being done, but for example, Andrew is making a, with the students an amazing wall uh, to be installed here in Philadelphia. Uh, we are also working on some other, other projects, but what I thought was also really important, um, you know, many universities amazing robots, but very often they get used for a few years and then they retire. Unwillingly, I think. But they retire, and um, when we started talking about having robots, we decided from the beginning that we thought it was really important to get it also in the first two years. So basically start in the, well, in the second year. So we started developing a course that is called ARC 636, that basically um, is called Material Formations and introduces the first kind of thinking of robots, robotic production, but also what it does to change design and design thinking and how you start to create uh, different performances. And of course then also uh, we keep going in uh, this, the 704 Design Studio. Um, more importantly, uh, somewhere also around 2014, we had a second master's that was then called the PPD that became an MSD program. We, we, there's many reasons we started MSD programs, but actually the most interesting one was that if you have one MSD program, you can add more. Um, which means you can start to really specialize in really interesting subjects that we feel are reasons, one, to come at Penn, but also for our own students to maybe branch eventually out into. So 2014, we have the AAD, Advanced Architectural Design, in 15, the EBD, Environmental Building Design. Um, AAD, of course, the director is Ali Rahim, EBD, Bill Braham. And then in 2019, we got the MSD RAS, Robotics and Autonomous Systems. Um, the other thing that ARI does, the, the lab, is uh, in itself, it mostly is organizational, I have to say, for now. Um, but what we do is we, um, we find people interested in robotics. And for example, here is one person that is an, actually a Penn alum that um, gave us money to build a tiny house, as he called it. Um, but then we also started working with Semex. So in the meantime, the tiny house has become a huge production. 
<laughs> of multiple years and we are hoping that this year somewhere this tiny house will be built um, more or less in the form you see here um, in Penovation. Another um, partnership actually thanks to Ezio Blazetti was with Le Monde, Compo Le Monde Composites um, a really generous gift of material uh, for uh, test in structural carbon fiber um, the students in the RES are working with that there is also a course uh, working with that in elective course and of course our ulterior motive is to get this as a very large pavilion uh, it was planned as you can see here for the 2020 Venice Architecture Biennale which probably now will be uh, it moved one year so 2023 I guess right is now the next one it's kind of you have to think when things are nowadays um, but then also really beautiful is our Semex uh, collaboration um, Semex as you might know is, in, is a Mexican company but they have their global R&D in Switzerland and for a few years already the 701s students have gone to uh, Switzerland to uh, work on uh, experimenting with different forms of concrete and different shapes and uh, it's actually really really fun brings out your inner child I would say mine especially um, and then the last thing uh, to, to just quickly give an idea so we also did an exhibition uh, with the I was one of the creative directors for the Italian uh, virtual pavilion um, curated by Tom Kovac and Alessandro Melis who asked us to investigate and identify dynamics of change and engagement with nature and we have six exhibits there of six faculty members Max, Masoud, Dorit, Carol, uh, Ferda, Lea and Robert um, and uh, here you see actually they're, um, they're all movies or animations unbelievable if you haven't seen them please do go and see them and uh, ultimately also all of this will end up in a book coming out in November in Italy uh, we might try and go there I've been trying to go to Italy for a year now every time they close the borders or we close the borders is always a border closed um, but why did we do robotics robotics we really did because the architectural practice is changing fast and um, this is kind of under uh, under investigated uh, I think in many schools it's also not taken very seriously but actually most of what uh, is being built right now has been produced uh, by a robot including my Tesla but also um, this is actually a project we worked on and I'll just give a tiny example um, because I think it's quite fun like even if you do a small project um, or a large project but even for a small project it's perfectly worth uh, prototyping uh, making a one-to-one -one prototype making it um, robotically uh, CNC'd and then essentially being able to optimize the engineering the performance and the way this would work uh, this is um, one of the units in a large meditation center but the same robots also get used to basically cut all these prefabricated segments uh, that ultimately make some um, a unit that can be assembled and disassembled um, and then results in these large strange volumes that end up in the meditation space and inside look uh, like this so interesting of course is that this is the most simple looking space that is one of the most engineered things we ever made it has um, a very advanced uh, air conditioning system that is super, so distributed that you never feel any air movement uh, you cannot meditate if you actually feel air blasting on top of you uh, but the same with the sound so there is micro um, uh, speakers all around this dome it's between the two skins so actually there is an out an outside skin that is quite solid as you can see here sorry I'm, conf <laughs> I'm confusing you <laughs> um, but between that outside skin and this uh, fabric inside skin is a space that is full of sprinklers speakers air conditioning uh, and all uh, all that beautiful stuff and lighting and uh, the lighting also works 
very precisely that I hate actually LED colors, but these LED colors are um, aimed to um, stimulate your circadian rhythm, which means that fall, spring depression actually can be alleviated by that. So um, very simple space, very robotic, highly engineered and tiny. So if that is possible, then you have to think any time you're going to work on anything that is remotely bigger, houses, uh, even social housing and or big buildings like our stadium in China, it all gets fabricated like this. And this is why it is super important to think not only what robotics means in architecture, but also how are we going to change our design uh, to think differently and to be ready for something that is called FTF, file to factory manufacturing. Your 3D file goes through a, a, to a 3D uh, either printer and or robotic uh, manufacturing thing. So with this, I want to open uh, this panel discussion on architecture and robotics, new modes of practice and pedagogy. And I will uh, give the word to Robert, uh, who will introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Winker. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the, uh, for this exciting discussion tonight on architecture and robotics, new modes of practice and pedagogy. Tonight is mostly a conversation about Penn's new MSD in Robotics and Autonomous Systems, a program that started uh, 12 months ago. So today it's its first birthday, or perhaps its origins episode. How's that? Okay. So I've invited the core MSD RAS teaching faculty to discuss their thoughts on the program with you tonight. And we're so fortunate, actually, that all these instructors are all world class. They're fantastic at what they do. They're all specialists. And um, they're also fantastic colleagues and friends. And it's, it's really fantastic that they could all make it here. Some of them have traveled from quite far away. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to them. Um, so in terms of the participants tonight, we have, obviously, Professor Winker Doubledom, Chair of Architecture and Director of Penn's RE Robotics Lab, Professor Andrew Saunders, Director of Penn's MARC program, adjunct professor Billy Faircloth, partner of Kieran Timberlake, Ezio Blazetti, senior lecturer at Penn, Jose Luis Garcia del Castillo y Lopez, director, of, sorry, lecturer at Harvard GSD, Nathan King, senior industry engagement manager at Autodesk, Ivan Gelis Kotsioris, curator at MoMA, and I don't think I mentioned Andrew Saunders. Uh, did I mention you? I, yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> Just checking. Couldn't see you in my notes. Um, it's there, but yeah. Okay. And then myself, um, Robert Stewart Smith, director of the MSD RAS program. Uh, so uh, the only instructor missing is Jeffrey Anderson, who sends his apologies that he couldn't join us this evening. I will be giving introductions again uh, for every talk this evening. There's a few talks that we will start with. Not everyone is talking. The priority for tonight is actually a discussion, uh, which will involve uh, everyone I've just mentioned. So we're going to give a few brief presentations. I'll talk for slightly longer at the beginning to, to introduce a little bit about the MSD RAS. And then we'll have Ivan Gelos, Kotsioros, Billy Faircloth, Jose Luis, and Nathan uh, speaking after that. And after that, we'll go into a general discussion. But we'll start with, it, uh, with how did we get to where we are. So as Winker mentioned, uh, around five years ago, maybe six, uh, that as chair, her and the architecture faculty determined that robotics would be included within the design curricula pen. And Winker created the Advanced Research and Innovation Lab with the help of Andrew Saunders, purchasing some small robots you see here. So this is what the lab looked like uh, when I arrived um, four years ago, coming with some experience in industrial scale robotics facilities, I worked with Winker, Dean Steiner, Carl Wellman, and Erdig McHenry Architects to develop a vision for the lab um, the, so that it could support world-class teaching and research. And you can see even two years ago, we had a storage facility on the left. Um, and we soon realized that 
realized we needed a lot more infrastructure and technology, but we had very little budget to achieve it. So we, we developed a proposal uh, for an expanded lab, and then the Dean's office, particularly Jeff Snyder, set about mo the momentous task of fundraising. And that's not something that happens overnight. Um, but literally within less than two years, after some generous donations, we actually had a completed renovation. We'd added some larger ABB robots on a track system, together with ventilation, safety systems, and auto tool changing, um, to enable a facility that can actually operate as a very flexible manufacturing space. So we can do a lot of things in quite a small space, um, and it can be used by a lot of different classes throughout a semester, um, and also can be involved in fabrication, like Winker mentioned that Andrew Saunders is doing a wall right now. Uh, so. So this is uh, the lab one year ago when uh, it was opened uh, basically in the initial weeks of the first year of the MSD RAS program. So why did Penn's faculty initiate and support such an immense and costly endeavor? Um, this was a, a big commitment. And so that takes us to my presentation. So industry is increase, increasingly using robot systems to not only automate existing construction, but also to undertake innovative means of prefabrication. And these technologies are offering untold opportunities to rethink our built environment. We knew that buildings are currently far from perfect and carry severe economic, environmental, and social impact. And that while design and construction are typically considered separate activities, um, they could operate as an integrated creative act. So we developed the post-professional MSD RAS program to explore the integration of robotics, material fabrication, and design computation in the pursuit of architecture, architectural design, manufacture, and use. And the deg degree considers how we go beyond automation towards more intelligent means of, of engagement with the world at large, addressing Industry 4.0 shift to bespoke, user-centered, on-demand autonomous systems. The program builds knowledge and skills in a number of areas with a focus on design through experimental fabricated prototypes, alongside engagement in architectural discourse and theory with topics such as cybernetics or the politics of making. Evangelis's course also incorporates some amazing guest lecturers. The one-year program considers all its courses of equal importance. Design operates through parallel thinking across an integrated curricula. In spring, all courses contribute to a common project that's realized through a fabricated prototype and a thesis book. In fall, we explore manufacturing methods such as robot hot wire cutting, which can rapidly manufacture complex geometries with far less waste or time than CNC milling. In Saunders Design Studio, this method is leveraged to produce component parts that operate within partial mock-ups for ceiling designs designs that are then developed as larger field organizations using convolutional neural networks, exploring the strange interface between the digital, robotics, and physical design domains. In Blazetti's course, fiber composite designs are partially determined through the development of jigs and computer-coded weaving operations that enable the fabrication of design prototypes such as this lightweight bundled structure or these materially efficient flat-packed fabricated assemblages. In spring, students undertake a single project in groups that has worked across four subject areas, including scientific research and writing, experimental matter, looking at material and industrial processes and tooling, advanced RAS programming, and a design studio. The design research-led studio takes a critical approach to production, such as how architectural ceramics can move from Fortis production towards more bespoke manufacturing. This is being questioned alongside the learning of advanced real-time robot programming or, and augment, augmented reality. And the consideration of scaling for industrialization and robot tooling. In RAS, all things are considered active contributors to creative outcomes. A depth camera or clay are in some sense a design ingredient. While computing methods question material organization at a range of scales. Manufacturing engages with material dynamics, necessitating real-time feedback, moving beyond automation towards degrees of autonomy. 
students develop custom manufacturing processes and robot tools to reduce waste while generating creative possibilities. Projects aim to expand design agency to address issues that are not easily explored without some advanced technical knowledge. In this project, a hollow core ceramic cladding was designed to transport urban steam waste to help grow community gardens in urban residual space. A generative design methodology connects areas of high solar exposure to steam vent locations. This full-scale partial mock-up is the primary medium in which the design is developed and tested. As you can see, a project like this is both speculative and grounded in production-orientated design research. Another example project proposes a multi-species facade screen, which doubles as a bird habitat. It incorporates generative design methods that operate both digitally and materially, with novel approaches to additive manufacturing that incorporate six-axis printing and robotic smearing to produce material effects that are not solely aesthetic, but also offer a form of agency as pockets of non-human habitat for birds. As mentioned, design research is developed and tested through the fabrication of experimental prototypes. Uh, making is incorporated into the curriculum from day one, and that's where most things are learned. In the RAS program, we don't adopt materiality, we engage with it. Prototypes inform design outcomes. As with any program, the RAS is shaped by the students and their work. They are the program. The program succeeds when its graduates succeed. We aim to empower students to not only build knowledge and skills, but to become leaders that can make a difference in this world. Directly after our first graduation ceremony, some of our very first graduates were engaged with a local Philly community, sponsored by Penn Praxis to work as researchers with RAS instructor Andrew Saunders and Erding McHenry Architecture. They were working on a feature wall uh, for a community library, Roosevelt Library. This is the wall design here and parts of it in fabrication um, here. And I'll end on this slide where you can see uh, a prototype that the, the students have done and then the space in which it's going to be installed. So that feature wall, I'm sure Andrew will tell us more about it later, but that feature wall is right behind the stair there. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a flavor for the program. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to uh, our first speaker, Evangelis Katsioris, who teaches our, our RAS theory program. He's also a curator at MoMA. Uh, thank you, Evangelis. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be with everybody in the same room and to celebrate the first uh, anniversary of the program. And also, I think it's a great time to take stock and, and look ahead. So Rob asked me to talk a bit about uh, how we formed the uh, pedagogy, the, the theory pedagogy for the program, but also how has uh, historical models of ar architectural pedagogy and technology have informed it. So it happens that recently I'm um, currently completing a, a book project with uh, three colleagues at Princeton University, Beatrice Colomina, Ignacio Galan, and Anna Maria Meister, uh, which is titled Radical Pedagogies, and is a book, is an edited volume that will be published by MIT Press in early 2022. And uh, it gathers about 100 experiments in architectural education from the second half of the 20th century. So as one of the co-editors, uh, I was particularly drawn, obviously, in commissioning the case studies that looked at the ways in, in which computation dovetailed with architecture, for instance, by reviving a formerly defunct uh, computer center in Madrid, or much more, you know, well-known case studies for many people in this room, like the Architecture Machine Group at MIT, uh, where um, a number of architects, urbanists, computer scientists, cyberneticists, uh, formed uh, some of the early tools that looked at um, the use of computers in architecture and interaction, such as this amicable installation at the Jewish Museum in 1970 that uh, was actually a simulation of a living environment for living gerbils, and you see this kind of uh, semi-robotic arm moving around, continuously reconfiguring this environment and inadvertently killing some of the gerbils themselves. So one of the lessons of this research that actually is that actually uh, the coexistence and synergy of different strands of research only further uh, reinforces the outcomes. So it's not by coincidence that Marvin Minsky, 
um, a, you know, a pioneer in AI and also quite a problematic figure in many ways uh, that was uh, working um, at MIT at the time was also learning and teaching a robot how to build uh, by actually using architectural components. And I particularly like this um, research video from the lab that shows um, an arm and an experiment in early machine vision using kindergarten blocks in order to learn how to uh, identify forms in space and actually manipulate them to create structures. Now, another kind of uh, less expected, perhaps, uh, outcome of this work was that at the very same time that you have research enclaves like uh, the Architecture Machine Group, funded by DARPA and uh, the Department of Defense, by all places, uh, you have other pedagogues looking at the beginnings of architecture. You have people like the Prisker Laureate uh, Valkrishna Doshi from India, looking at indigenous building practices to create low-cost housing or even people like Adolfo Natalini in Italy going even further back in history to look at the creation of the first instruments and tools uh, by humans and effectively by builders. So when thinking about how to formulate a curriculum for the theory practice, for the theory course of, of the program, uh, it was re literally looking at these different kinds of directions that we tried to pull together. To look at the technological and the architectural, the advanced and the primordial, the social and the political. So since my, my, my brilliant colleagues are obviously covering all the kind of aspects that, uh, that take place inside the studio and the laboratory, uh, this course is really a place for discourse and conversation. For instance, we look at the origins of these systems, but not just to fetishize them as, you know, this kind of techno-positivist advancements. For instance, uh, the Urban 5 program by the Architectural Machine Group, which was an early kind of um, urban design um, system, could not have been possible outside the invention of the same system in the mid-50s, uh, the first real-time computing and early warning system for energy enemy bombers produced um, at the height of the Cold War. And it's interesting to note that throughout in time, these kinds of funding structures that enabled different programs like the SAGE system at MIT were not just met with um, a universal approval. Actually, students took the streets in 1969 to protest the involvement of um, the research resources of a university like uh, MIT towards this purpose. Purposes. But we also look at the kind of brighter and lighter aspects of this history. We look at the importance of fiction in visualizing and pre-rendering, if you like, the kind of future scenes that are yet to come from the very kind of um, from the invention of the word robot, which actually we discussed today in class, that finds its roots in the 1920 play by Carl Chapik, all the way to the idea of the robotic architect, architect, which is actually a fantasy that goes back all the way to antiquity, both in Greece and Egypt, but all the way to the beginning of the 20th century in France. We look at the political dimension of architecture and construction, and in particular the politics that are not easy to discern at first. For instance, the ways in which politics and discrimination can be technologically reinforced through different biases. For instance, the ways in which Codex uh, Shirley cards uh, produced to, to calibrate color printing for uh, color films in the 1970s would preferentiate white skin tones versus darker skin tones. We look at the ways in which technology tends to be gendered and even ascribed a different agency according to these divisions and how that is informed by geographical contexts. And we look at the ways in which the materials and the ecologies of materials that we produce as architects uh, can either leave their mark behind or they actually can decompose and can, be, uh, can uh, leave space for new things to come. All this is also coming together at, towards the end of the course in the idea of the societal dimension of architecture and fabrication. We look at the ways in which mass customization is not just about producing, you know, uh, well-packaged products for mass consumption, but also can be really a fundamental way of reinforcing and empowering population segments that have been under, um, uh, underserved. We look at the ways in which we even, are, uh, as a species, we design our own extinction and design our own um, um, escape into far-flying worlds in which we will have 3D printed habitats to inhabit very soon. And finally, the, the one thread that perhaps runs throughout the whole course is not just our relationship in constructing technology, not just our way, the ways in which we build robots and we build tools, but actually how technology shapes us, nurtures us, and how we can grow together with these wondrous machines. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Van Gelis. Uh, now, Billy Faircloth, who uh, runs our scientific research and writing class, will talk to us. She's also a partner at Kieran Timberlake. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'm not going to talk specifically about the scientific research and writing course, but I'm going to talk more generally about the role of research in the MSDRS program and why it's essential to the program. So first, um, just to note, and I, we've already begin, begun talking about this tonight, and you heard it come up again and again in both of the, the talks that we just heard, but research is a mode, really, or a way for us to engage design. And our profession is embracing research methods uh, for designers, but also for integrated teams. And it's, we're re embracing research, whether it's under the heading of design research or research by design, whether it's affiliated with degree programs or with consortia. Um, we are engaging various traditions of research that are really transforming our interests, our curiosity, our concerns into questions. But more importantly, these are questions to be framed and to be investigated and ultimately knowledge to be created and to be shared. So one of the things that's really clear about the, this field that we're discussing is that research in this field is not monolithic. Research encompasses a range of topics. Yes, robotics and robots, which we've been talking about, but also broadly material systems and computation. More specifically, it encompasses a range of fields and subfields. And so these are subdisciplines from artificial intelligence and variations such as human in the loop or additive manufacturing or collective robotic construction and cyber physical systems. We could go on and on. We could map all of the disciplines or all of the fields and subfields. There's also the, the understanding that this field, as you begin to see from the aim and ambition of the program, incorporates a range of pressing issues, such as the meaning of automation, or approaches to materials processing and waste, social and ecological impacts of our extractive and constructive activities. The field also embraces partnerships across industry and academia, as well as teams that are inherently interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. And I point out this context because this is the context in which research or inquiry in this field thrives. So more generally, the MSDRSA program positions graduates to embrace a range of topics in the field and to directly participate in practice transformation. It prioritizes both the social and technical dimensions of this work. So the process of research is integral to the program and begins with a simple acknowledgement that the subject robotics fits within, as we've just seen, the history, theory, and application of broader technological systems that have both social and technological momentum, and I say this after Hughes, and likewise social and technical implications. So research is applied. It's meant to be situated in a larger context to engage critical issues through critical thinking. It also teaches a process for systematic inquiry. So our approach is really about going through a process of systematic inquiry and again, embracing traditions of design research or research by design. Students are meant to share their interests, discover how research is structured, conducted, communicated by directly applying various methods and also engaging faculty researchers as well as guests within the field. The program emphasizes an integrated teaching model as, as uh, Rob has already showed us. And this is actually quite important because what it means is that learning objectives, especially learning objectives related to inquiry, are shared across faculty in individual courses. So for instance, as Rob's already mentioned, in the spring we have this full complement of coursework that engages design, programming, materials, and scientific research and writing. And these are integrated in such a way that we can begin to see the feedback loops of questions between the different courses Courses, but more importantly, begin to recognize that even within one research project, we can find multiple paths of inquiry or multiple subjects of inquiry. So finally, our approach to research emphasizes participation in a design research community, which I think is actually quite authentic to this field, that we can get together, 
that we can share our ideas, that we can come together to understand or build the understanding of knowledge production and knowledge sharing. So this work prioritizes a team-based approach to research and a team-based approach to the co-production of knowledge. Thank you, Billy. So Jose Luis Garcia de Castillo Lopez um, teaches with Jeffrey Anderson our advanced RAS programming course in the spring. He's uh, the founder of Parametric Camp and the program of um, X, Robot X Machina and a uh, lecturer from Harvard GSD. Thank you. All right. Um, robots, robots, robots. <laughs> they're fun, they're modern, they're sexy, they're techy, like, and we literally make everything with robots. Everything that is in this room has been touched by a robot when it was made. But what is, we even make food, like seriously. All the food that we process is made with robots. But what is the only thing that we're still not making with robots? Oh, I didn't stop the sound. Oh, that's cheesy. The only thing that we're not still doing with robots is buildings. Is that me? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> the only thing we're still not making in the 21st century with robots is buildings. And we've tried. In Japan, there was actually a lot of research going on in the 80s to how to automate construction sites. Yet, it didn't really work out. And like Evangelios was showing before, we've been dreaming about this since the 19th century. There was this vision of the architect with this, all these machines building things on site, yet it hasn't happened. We're not there yet. So what is going on? I would like to propose today that I think we might be looking at the wrong problems when we think about these problems. One of them, for example, is that we typically blame that robots are just not good enough for construction sites, yet, Boston Dynamics, for example, has been working on the spot robot for many years already. It's out in the market, and it's been three years already, and they can't really figure out how to use it on the construction site. And the best use so far is surveying, so 3D scanning construction sites, and surveillance, making sure that the right people are in the right place. Um, also, there's a problem with robots, with using industrial robots that have been designed for automation. We're using machines that were designed for serialized construction to do tasks that have to be done over and over again. And we have a tradition in architecture of buildings and thinking about buildings as assemblies of parts and automating their assembly. And actually, for example, Gropius did a lot of work, like seriously tried in the 30s, to do prefabrication, pre-serialization, etc. Yet, there's something about architecture as a serialized, automated practice that it just doesn't work with us. So how can we expect machines that are designed for serialized automation to work well in architecture? It's, it's a little bit of a conundrum, in my opinion. Now, I may venture to suggest also that the problem is not on the machines. It's partly on us. And uh, I say this because how do we actually talk and do we relate to machines? Alvin Toffler was already discussing in 1981 how we were transitioning from an industrial age, from, from what he called the second wave, to an information age, what he called the third wave. And predicting that there was gonna, among many other things, that there was gonna be a shift from mass production to mass customization, and that this was gonna happen because of the information and because of integrating the customer into the process not because we were making better machines. Um, and we are indeed transitioning to factories that look much less like a bad steampunk dream and more like a futuristic techno lab, if, if you will. So my suggestion is that a lot of work remains to be done not on the hardware, not on the machine part of the robots, but on the information side, on the soft side, on the software that runs on robots. I, for example, industrial robots typically are run like 3D printers. You create a file that 
contains all the instructions, you plug it in, and you execute. That's great for 3D printing, and that's what I call automation. However, if instead we challenge that, and then we're able to send instructions in real time to a robot and control how the 3D print is happening as it is happening, then that's not automation anymore. That's integration. And if we want robots to work on a construction site, along with humans and with all the things that are constantly changing the environment and be responsive to all of this, what we need is not to automate the process of robots, but to integrate the process of these robots with the humans and the environment that they're working with. Which leads me to my last proposal or my last provocation here, which is we are still in the infancy of human-robot collaboration. We all know how to use an iPhone. We have designed a lot of infrastructure around that, yet only a few experts are capable of using robots. And uh, robot communication and robot collaboration should be as intuitive and easy as other technologies are out there, other ones that are popular. And that would lead to reducing all the overhead that is currently present in learning how to use robots and then focusing on creative tasks to be done along with robots. Um, the good news about this is that this is not an engineering problem. This is a design problem. It's a problem that we can all tackle because it involves humans and the interfaces that we use to access robots. And uh, I think all of us here as designers, we have a great capacity to rethink, to redesign, and to create novel ways uh, about how we make humans and robots work together. That's why we're here, that's why we have this master's going on, and that's a little bit of the agenda that we try to share with all the students and all the participants and all the work that we do together in the, in the program. And with this, thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, so Nathan King uh, will be giving our last presentation before we go into discussion. Uh, Nathan teaches our experimental matter class that covers uh, materials, um, industrialization, and robot tooling. Uh, he uh, is a senior um, industrial engagement manager at Autodesk uh, in the Boston build space um, and co-director of the CDR at Virginia Tech and a lecturer at Harvard GSD. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> One thing that strikes me about this program is that we can start to think about the things that we've been doing for the last, say, 15 to 20 years as a collective group of individuals and think about the next step and actually what it is and what the impact is of the work that we're doing. One of the things that's clear just in my, my own portfolio is that it's very hard to do this from one place or with one group of people and expanding this as a community of people doing things together is really the only way we're gonna progress to that next level. Often we get the question of why, why are robots or why robots in design? Why do we care and what opportunities do those, those afford? What is the real purpose of doing this? I use these marketing slides that were developed by Autodesk based on real data to talk about the why. We need to build 13,000 buildings a day, every day between now and 2050. And really this was true 10 years ago, so now that's probably accelerated even more. This represents a doubling of productivity need. We have to wrap the world in 30 times each year in transportation infrastructure to provide enough movement and mobility of people and goods around the world to support the population growth. At the same time we need to do that, there are $4 trillion of assets at risk of climate change, sea level rise, five billion people, half the world's population living in areas where resources are limited, and these aren't construction resources, but basic everyday resources like water. And 90% of those people are gonna be living in cities, and most of those cities are coastal. At the same time, we have 20% of the workforce retiring. If you try to do any work recently, and most regions around the world, you find labor availability and labor productivity to be a challenge. As skilled labor, labor moves out of the workforce, how do we replace that? This paints a pretty dire picture and it's used to talk about why we need to accelerate the industry, but it also presents an opportunity. And if we can think about ourselves as designers working in that world, we have an opportunity. 
I'm going to counter Rob's comment about the large robots and say you can do a lot of things with small robots as well. You can make big things with small robots, which I think would be a great challenge for us. We can think about design opportunities, complex form. This is a structural geometry where the nodes are made by a robot. We can think about new tools. One of the great things, very pragmatic, you can build a tool to go on the end of the robot. That tool can be used to manipulate a material. That's really all we're talking about here. Connecting those things from a design idea to some kind of instantiation, this is sort of Cathalon House from 2007, to then thinking about how we move outside of the academic sphere, this research in, that we do in the university to industry collaborative research and translating those technologies into practice. But is this really the right translation? Is a building in Manhattan the proper translation for a robotic technology? A counterpoint is using that same computational workflow uh, is this facade for the cholera treatment center in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, that has 32,000 custom handmade components, these folded tabs. So countering that to the robotic fabrication and deploying the appropriate technology where it's needed, also part of the critical thinking that we learn through the design through making process that we have in the academic environment. The projects like this one where we have many, many custom components, and I would say this is still low volume production. This is a, a unit of one. Uh, this is parts for a bridge. It's called the Arroyo Bridge by Mad Workshop, uh, led by a guy named R. Scott Mitchell in our technology center in Boston, along with a lot of collaborators. Again, lots of people involved. But here we're taking many, many parts that are generated from a digital model, producing a bridge that's constructed kind of in the middle of nowhere using cranes and component assemblies that are put together to form this one-off custom, low-volume custom unit of one. Jumping to a totally different context where we need 1,200 distributed healthcare clinics. This is on the coast of Lake Victoria in Uganda. Uganda has a demand for 700 of these clinics right now. Zambia, 1,200. And thinking through how we can link design tools, in this case Revit, but any of our computational design tools, to an automation process that's actually appropriate for the context in which the process is happening. So how can we build those 13,000 buildings a day in areas where we don't have technologies, labor, and cranes like we do in Manhattan, but thinking about ways in which we deploy these technologies to create parts and components for buildings and ultimately arriving at this kind of thing. And this is a piece of architecture. It's a building. It has some infection control design standards built into it. But the takeaway from this is that this is a hospital built by the government of Zambia, normally six-month project which is under roof here in six weeks using an automated tool. So when we think about going from what we're doing here, which can often, you know, playing with robots and clay, to then deploying that thought process across the entire spectrum of need and opportunity for us to work together, using the technology to actually meet some kind of outcome or need that is a real demand in industry. So it's not speculative, and there are a lot of robots that are retired on campuses. But the opportunity that we have here is to work together to actually push students that are focusing on the technology, but not for the sake of the technology, for the sake of the impact that technology will have, both on decision-making framework throughout their career, but also uh, the processes uh, by which the industry is, is operating now and in the future. And with that, that's the end. Thank you, Nate. And um, can I invite the entire panel to come up and take a seat, um, and we'll start some discussion. It was self-organization. It's, yes. it's a little bit funny without tables, but imagine it's more like a, a, a set of movie stars discussing their latest movie or, or a jazz band or something. Yeah. Um, so I've organized a series of questions around kind of three key topics. Um, so based, basically education, design and technology, and then community and industry. Um, and, I, and I'm going to start by asking Winka, um, can we take these off, by the way? Yeah. Is it space? space? I think this is six feet. Um, <laughs> 
So, yeah, Winker, um, you're an academic and practice leader. Um, you're also the chair of architecture and you founded the ARI Robotics Lab. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what motivated you um, to initiate all these amazing things at Penn um, and what you think Penn's role would be uh, and edge in contributing to this emerging field? Yeah, I, th I think I gave some of it away maybe in my introduction, but um, it's a good question, Rob. I think one was jealousy because um, Michigan had a really great robot and Wes, so that was one. <laughs> but it's also inspiration, right? I think really good competition is actually the best thing you can have. So it made it made also, um, even when I wasn't chair yet, kind of makes you think. But I also was struck by, by what I said earlier, is that um, uh, a lot of places had amazing robots, but then they were great for two or three years, and then they were retired unwillingly, right? And then there was like this very expensive robot sitting by itself in a room. I remember I started in Harvard many when I was still a practice professor, so this is like Harvard had a a six-axis robot sitting in a closet for a long time, a really big one. And everyone was kind of scared of it. And so it's, it's interesting, you know, there's a, there's a long history of robots that no one knew what to do with. Until um, I took my students to, um, to LA once um, for a studio where I, I told them we're not going to look at architecture, we're going to look at everything else that makes intelligent form so that's not architecture, sadly, right? And and that is that is kind of a maybe a sad statement. Anyway, we went to LA. We looked at Audi's um, factory. We visited this person who had is the biggest independent car plane boat designer in LA. Um, actually, he made that prototype for the meditation uh, pod. And um, we went to Geary Technologies, but we didn't want to see Geary, which was really kind of a funny story because Geary couldn't stand that. He ran into Dennis Sheldon's office where we were sitting and he was like, this, what, what, Vinka, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, this, you were looking at your amazing technology. And he's like, yeah, okay, so um, I give you half an hour and then we're going to see the architecture. So it's also interesting, right? Like this, there's, there's a push and pull between it. So anyway, long story short, what I realized very quickly, uh, and that's maybe why I organized this studio then, was that um, everyone seemed to be making interesting form and intelligent uh, incorporation of technology in those forms, except for architecture. You know, you cannot open your aluminum window if you tried. You need four people to help you slide a window open in this country. So it's, it's, it's sad, it's a sad state. And I think if you look at your car, you think it's pretty normal that you can push a button and your window goes down. Why is that not in your house? Why are we not asking that question to ourselves? Or why is architecture as a profession so archaic? You know, it's an interesting, you know, it's a worldwide problem, right? It's not even a country that you can point at and say, well, that country is kind of buying. No, it's a worldwide problem. So we, and I think, you know, you mentioned uh, a little bit, like, you know, we are always building the one prototype, right? It's the prototype of one. Um, but you can also think that, uh, and actually I saw Morphosis uh, name there, and I'm just writing a text for um, Tom Main's book, where I'm writing about that, because, you know, you can also think a facade is made of varying components, those varying components um, are compiled together to make a bigger whole, and those could be uh, repeating units. So there are ways we can think uh, as assemblies of, of units um, and think of architecture like that, that that could become something um, that is not the typical uh, Le Corbusier domino. And what is, what is interesting is when uh, Andrew started here, I think my first task to Andrew when, when you started first year was like, Andrew, I want the students to think of something that is not slabs and columns, but is built of units. And how do, you, how do units aggregate, you know, to unlearn all the things we have already uh, assumed are normal and how can they not be normal and why are they normal? Can we start from scratch? And so that's how we started the 501 studio. Anyway, that was a very long answer, sorry. Very nice but, answer, yeah. yeah. Um, I might ask a second directed question and then if anyone wants to 
uh, kind of comment on what Wink is saying, go for it, or any, anyone who speaks now. But I'd like to ask um, Evangelis and Billy um, that basically architectural education's been caught oscillating often between kind of academic scholarly research and preparing people for professional practice, so kind of professional training. Um, there's also a lot of different models of design research out there. So what are your thoughts on MSD RAS's collaborative uh, approach to coursework and, and it's aimed to foster integrated thinking across, you know, kind of technical, theoretical design and research activities? Um, do you think there are any models that we should be adopting or, or avoiding? Uh, and, you know, perhaps can you think of things that might encourage addressing some of the concerns that Winker raised? about how backward maybe architecture is compared to other industries too. This, okay, so um, it, it just occurred to me as I was watching all the presentations that um, we have a bit of a, an assumption about what we're all pulling towards when I look at this work. And the assumption is that we're creating, I think, a healthier building culture and better outcomes. So when I think about this sort of integrated approach to collaboration, um, I guess one model that, that or I won't even say it's a model, Rob, but I think it's something that comes to the fore is that there is absolute need for us right now um, to do more than what research has done in the past in the scientific tradition and embrace another kind of research that says that we can uh, understand the outcomes of what we've created because if we can't then I don't think we can address your concerns Jose Luis that you that you sort of propose you pitched to us you said hey we were asking the wrong question right mm -hmm. so there's something like it just occurred to me as we we're looking at this there's something integrated into what we're talking about here that assumes that we're all pulling towards a healthy building culture and that we're interested in outcomes beyond the the sort of technical dimension of what we're talking about and that is a kind of model that I think we we need to talk about explicitly what does that look like what does that mean and how does it integrate uh, these these techniques so specifically because we could I think one model to avoid is to continue to spin around the axis of the integration of or the the, the research of materials theories and techniques just to continue to spin around that axis without really understanding outcomes could be a model that would be paralyzing us from actually doing what we want to do um, I don't know I'm I'm mar mostly marveling at the fact that I'm actually live and in person in an event, so I'm just in enjoying this. But um, but that like that that's something that I learned from from the presentations, and I think that's actually quite important. And then the other thing to note, this is actually also very very clear, is that the one thing we don't, I believe, we don't want to do, is we do not want to embrace, I think, a multidisciplinary model. And I say that because really what we need are inter and transdisciplinary models. And these are very, very different than a multidisciplinary model. The multidisciplinary model says that we stay in our own disciplines. You're going to be one expert, I'll be another one. But really what we see also in, I think, the coursework that we're talking about is a challenge to understand how we're asking questions together. And that's why the integrated approach is so important and that we're actually co-creating together, even though we might all springboard from di a different realm of expertise, that gets at the inter and transdisciplinary part of this, and that means that the pedagogy needs to support that kind of thinking. I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I went on way too long. Um, to add to that, you know, Cedric Price had this famous quote that uh, technology is the answer, but what, what was the question? Um, and that has that seems to have been the attitude for many of the kind of um, at least historical figures that I talked about. And uh, I, I, I keep telling our students that I think formulating the, the right questions for this program to answer also for their own practice is um, a much more ambitious and difficult and uh, worthy kind of pursuit. In that sense, you know, um, as Rob mentions, I mean, there, there, there has been this tradition of the research university that just hoards resources and knowledge and just keeps it for internal consumption and entertainment, and there has been this other model which is totally geared towards uh, preparing somebody to be a very efficient 
architect on the market. And I think neither of those are, are, are helpful anymore. And thankfully, uh, students are much more demanding than that. They, they have m much higher expectations in the ways in, in which our practice uh, connects with the world. And that's why I think um, offering, let's say, what I call the buffet of options or the multiplication of perspectives today uh, allows each one of them individually to, to follow the, the path that they find meaningful rather than have a single answer that this is the right kind of practice and this is the kind of right approach or the right tool or whatever. I think it's a much more rich terrain and that's what's exciting about this moment. So <clears throat> I've been in academia for about 10 years and I keep going back and forth between oh what is academic research? What is uh, non-academic research? How does that relate to design? How does that relate to practice? And I find it really interesting because you mentioned that we tend to talk about technology as the answer, but we don't really know the question. I think that's where I see the idea of design research. In design, we're often very focused about what are the right questions to answer? What are the opportunities that are out there? We don't really focus on solving a technical problem. We don't fo focus on optimizing an algorithm, finding a new chemical compound. And I think that's also one of the difficulties of design research, which is we focus on the questions, but then we have a kind of difficulty translating that into some kind of knowledge that is generalizable. Going back to the point of design is all about one-offs or like the eternal prototype and how do we actually generate knowledge that is it extrapolates to everyone from that aspect, right? So I think that's a question that I want to throw out there. What is your vision of what design research is or how can we designers and practitioners see research under those lens that sometimes doesn't really fit with the standard academic research model? I have this question all the time when I'm writing papers, for example, for conferences, like, you know? I'm, I'm going to pass it on to you. You're going to yes. pass it on yes. to me? Well, let me ask you, pass it Luis. Um, the um, work that Gropius did, that you showed, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, would you characterize that as design research? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, in that process, there were probably efficiencies, optimization routines, um, maybe even some questions about uh, material and specification. Right? I mean, it's like, it, so this, this question of where design research begins and ends, and whether or not it can incorporate more scientific traditions or more historical or artistic traditions in research, I think is one that is probably indicative of what design research is. That it has the capacity to do that, and it also has the capacity to be incredibly specific and systematic and, knowledge, and oriented to knowledge production, but it also has the capacity to be uh, incredi incredibly reactive based on rules of thumb, um, generating uh, knowledge on the spot. So it, it is a, like, I, I, for me, design is a method among many different types of research methods. That's beautiful. Design is a method. I'm going to go to the next question just to keep time. <laughs> um, nice conversation though. Uh, so actually Jose Luis and Ezio, you both have a lot of creative energy that you put into programming robots. How do you leverage these skills in your own work? And does creative engagement with autonomous systems, do you think it impacts authorship and aesthetics? Or collectively, do you think also through such approaches there's a risk of um, reduction in variation through automation? Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you all of you guys for the beautiful presentations. Um, I guess I can jump onto the first part of your question, Rob, in that, like, uh, let's say, programming and robotics and how it kind of relates uh, directly. Uh, let's say, in the way that we teach and the way that we design in our own method. But uh, I would differentiate a little bit programming from robotics just in as much as the way that I understand it today, programming is a necessary skill we should teach at people at elementary school. I mean, it's as fundamental as writing and mathematics and reading. Like, uh, And of course, for anyone that engages in anything that has to do with uh, robotics, even not the industrial robots that we're using here, but in any sense of the term, 
uh, robotics. It's absolutely fundamental. On the other hand, let's say robotic fabrication seems to be more in the tradition. Uh, of course, you can call it a technical skill, but it's a technical skill as much as architecture has always has its own craft, right? So like craft is necessarily part of what we do and robotic fabrication is our contemporary craft. Um, going back, of course, to many references that ultimately at some point, something's always touched by a machine before it arrives on um, an architectural scale. But in regards to variation, uh, to kind of get to the crux of your question, I guess, um, I would say the opposite, right? I mean, one, one could say that in the last 20 years with uh, uh, having more access uh, both to software um, software and hardware uh, for that matter. Democratization of uh, technology has gone into an extreme expansion worldwide, much more than it was uh, 20 years ago. Um, it has followed a, an explosion, right, of, uh, of expression that was unprecedented. At the, at the very least, it was maybe just in very small and specific localities beforehand. Um, I would see this as maybe currently we're, I don't know, however you guys want to count this, like second, third wave uh, of uh, the kind of following the tradition of the new normal. Um, so not everywhere, of course, it's the same uh, level of discussion or the same level of expertise, but it's undoubtable that the tools Again, software, hardware, and ultimately conceptual tools that we use today are so pervasive that um, one, um, one needs to approach things uh, from like a deeper level. And I think that's ultimately what, we're, uh, what all of you guys are discussing here in terms of the interdisciplinarity that <coughs> causes this dialogue. So. Can I run a quick poll to answer the question? Yeah, sure. Who sketches here? Pa paper, pen, drawing. Who likes sketching? Who believes the act of sketching helps you think through a process? Who would call that design? But you can call me crazy, nerd, whatever it is, but to me, programming a computer is the exact same thing. It's the same, programming a computer, writing code, gives me the exact same feeling. It's an iterative process, I add things, I change things, I move things around, I think through what I'm doing, I make decisions, and then I end up with a piece of code that is fairly opinionated. It comes from my beliefs mm -hmm. about how people should interact with robots, etc., etc. So to me, it's not, writing code in itself is not automation. It doesn't lead to automation, it doesn't have to lead to automation, right? Um, I was going to say something else, and I lost track of it. It was a little bit of a trick question, because what we're on about is not automation. Uh -huh. um, so you guys answered kind of the first part about programming. I mean, I would agree. I program a lot too, and for me, it's just like a pencil. I often say that as well. It's just an ex another means to, to think and act. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess the part of the question was kind of relating to, I think, we went through a period in the 90s where there was a lot of kind of digital exploration. And what kind uh, of exploration? Digital. digital. And I think mm -hmm. there was a kind of explosion of tools that actually led to a little bit, I would argue, a normalization across the architecture profession where you suddenly started seeing like Voronoi buildings everywhere, <laughs> you know? Um, but I would argue that that um, normalization is only there if you're not actually making an original contribution. As soon as you make an original contribution, then that's a, kind of an irrelevant um, discussion. Um, and when we're talking about what we're doing in the program and, and where we are with industry now is much more to do with mass customization and bespoke manufacturing, which of course is not in the domain of a lack of variation, it's an expansion of it, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it actually made me very nervous, your stick, uh, your computer <laughs> putting the little wood sticks. I wanted to slap that computer, <laughs> and, uh, the robot, because it's like, you know, like, yeah, we could have that thing be made by a robot, but honestly, my cousin, who is a carpenter, can probably do that faster, no? Um, and, and then, you know, the absolute great thing, of course, is that you can help build these clinics really fast. Um, 
I, I actually worked in uh, in uh, Liberia on an uh, orphanage for uh, kids with five different buildings, uh, library and the dormitories and a health clinic and whatever. And I remember that uh, we we really wanted the locals to make the the perforated concrete bricks. And they were actually very fast in uh, producing that because they have very, you know, they have numbers, right? Like in China, they have a million people doing a, a very simple action and they made a ton of variations. But what is really interesting about, I think, manufacturing is that you can, you can actually teach a robot very quickly to make small variations and, and drive that through a facade, like the one that did the little turns, right, of the flips. Was it you? The metal facades, yeah, where they turned the little thing slightly different. And so I think there is, there is a, and I think in a way here in academics, we kind of need to focus on, on uh, if it is design research that really it drives to other solutions, like completely other solutions. And, and you know, I think um, I worked a lot with MIT Media Lab and probably slightly polluted by that, but like, I think to try and like get people like Semex and the carbon fiber people and whatever to sponsor our research, but then to really think of what are the new forms and what are the new possibilities we can get in architecture that is better than a car. You know, like you, it's, a, it's a stiff competition if my car has like, you know, bent metal on the outside, poofy leather on the inside, inside is a ton of technology and it's, you know, $20,000. And my house is, God knows, two million? For what, right? I mean, you look at it and you think like, man, you know, where did they put the money? Honestly, if a car is 20, right? So it's, 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 there is so much to figure out that it's really, I'm super excited that we have um, the RES, but also I'm super excited that all of you, our students, um, are going to be our vectors into that, right? Like you're going to start renovating thinking. And, and um, I think it's Michel Serre, it's like never solve a problem, but think of the right problem. Um, you know, I think the first thing you always want to say as an architect, you're not a problem solver. You're a problem creator. And those problems are interesting. And those are, those are the ones that need to be looked at. I think that's what you were also saying. That's like you know that that is really important. The moment you think you're solving problems, you've lost it. You know you are going to be doing very uninteresting things. So you can a question can be solved in many more ways than one. Right? We all know that. But yeah, sorry. That's Go great. Ahead. Um, okay, this about. question's for everyone. It's not directed at anyone in particular. Um, does a focus on robotics and computation place too much emphasis on process and distract from the artifacts or agency of design? Or might they escalate our engagement with material outcomes? Do philosophical and theoretical constructs such as vital materialism, post-humanism, or object-oriented philosophy influence your work? I can answer the process part of that. Um, yes, but it's often that the, the computational process and the, the robotic process replaces the other part of making. And so you're right. Uh, and actually those sticks in that project were, were handmade by two students who knew woodworking. And one of the dangers that we have in thinking about multidisciplinary versus transdisciplinary in this conversation is forgetting that there are experts and the things that we are doing in the lab with the robot. There are people that, there's an entire field of people that program robots for a living, an entire field of people that engineer into factors, an entire field of ceramicists and potters and, you know, true experts. And we're none of those, although some of you are. I don't program. Um, I can program the robot, but I think one of the things that we have is, is really a disconnect. It's the going into the robotic e exercise with a limited knowledge about materials and process, often leads to conclusions that are based on that experience, which is an educational tool, it's amazing, but as a tool for shifting the trajectory of the industry is, is challenging. And so I wonder what opportunity is there if, if one of those multi-disciplines are material, you know, actually the experts, like your Simex example, it's 
so again, like getting the experts involved. And we teach a, a class at the GSD. It's now probably in its 11th year around ceramics and potential opportunities for ceramics and digital fabrication. And it's funny how many students at the end of the, the semester say that we found the limitations of the material, even though anyone, we, we know that's not the case. And so in a way it feels like there's a shortage of materials and process that would mm -hmm. help inform actual development in, in the robotic side rather than hindering. Yeah, I was super interested. Who showed the bioplastics in the bubbles? That looked really interesting. You did? It's actually a Dutch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was like, the, you didn't show what they make with that. What did they make with that? They make small design objects into vases and then pots and, and, and uh, plates and things like that. So the scale is obviously small, but you know, there's a whole discourse on biomaterials yeah. um, in architecture. Um, I wanted to add maybe to, to, to the previous um, question also the fact that um, th there used to be a very innocent and beautiful time, not, not long ago, where just <laughs> milling a surface and putting it in a steakhouse in Las Vegas was an accomplishment on its own. On its own. And I think that that is no longer the case, thankfully, right? Um, and just like we talked, we talked about, you know, digital natives, and I, I, I guess all of our students are. Uh, I, I would think of the moment where we have robotic natives, because these, you know, all these kinds of new toys are obviously very cumbersome in the beginning to work with, and students can be very absorbed with the technical dimension. But it's always important, especially at school, to to take that step back and reflect on them, on, on what 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 we're trying to accomplish here, which is beyond. The, the, the simple task of getting something to work. Um, and that, that, that's, I think, the role of the school, that it provides you this luxury of time and space uh, to, to experiment with that uh, wiggle room, um, rather than go straight into practice and try to apply, mm -hmm. you know, one-to-one -one what, what somebody learned. Yeah, I think what's interesting, um, I think during your presentation, uh, you mentioned the, the term not falling into the kind of uh, techno or technology positivist, isn't that the term you use? And I think that's certainly something that's kind of at the heart of your question, Rob. I mean, all of those three categories of uh, OOO and new materialist and what was the third one? Um, and uh, posthumanism. Posthumanism. I think all of those are more general kind of humanities coming into it, right? And it's an interesting question here at Penn, you know, how do one deal with that? You know, having taught for 20 years in a number of different arenas and going to school and some that aren't humanities and some that are, uh, I think those are really valid questions of how to kind of um, develop a criticality here that avoids that sort of techno-positivist attitude, which we see that's kind of prevalent within the industry. And what is that? I think you have to, kind of look at, um, you know, the tools, obviously there's a learning curve, but it's more interesting what they can't do than trying to figure out what they can do. And that, that's a hard thing for students coming in in a two semester uh, program where they don't already know what they can do, but they can have to learn what they do and also uh, kind of suspend their disbelief and push it to things that they can't or never would have understand to have these machines do, you know, that are so repetitive and bringing a criticality. And I think that's somewhere, you know, either uh, kind of integrating ideas through humanities or even within the architecture discipline where it's really important because otherwise, you know, it just becomes kind of a vocational program, which obviously it's not, even though we're not, <laughs> we certainly want uh, students to have jobs and, careers after that, but I do think that there has to be that criticality, and it's interesting working with so many great faculty that have years of experience that bring those into some of the amazing work that's happening in the studios and seminars, never has that sort of one-to-one -one efficiency model, which is, I think, something that may sometimes be what students kind of feel comfortable and want to, want to uh, learn right off the bat. You know? Do you want to say anything? No? It's here? No, I'm, I'll jump in on the next one. It's okay. 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 All right. So, um, Nathan and Andrew, 
can robotics research at Penn address issues such as social and economic inequality or climate change? Are such advanced technologies only for elite few, or are we able to engage with local communities or developing economies? And I think in the presentations we've already touched on a number of projects from both of you that relate to this question. Sure. Well, I can uh, you know, just continue. One of the projects that we're working on now is a really nice opportunity. Scott Erty, who teaches here, uh, has a firm, Erty McHenry, uh, in Philadelphia, and you know, they're a vast amount of work. One of the projects they're working on is a community center, and um, he came to us with the idea of actually taking some of the things that we are working on in the studio and actually pushing them to full scale with a kind of large fabricated wall. But one of the issues behind I me, mean, there's many issues and many kind of things that the, the project takes on. One of the things is this community center is one of the first and oldest that actually was had maker space involved in it. So it's an opportunity to kind of um, start to inspire not even just the youth, but all of those that kind of come to this community center and makerspace to kind of understand that there's other uh, larger possibilities out there with this technology. And um, I think in the same way, you know, moving beyond just the kind of what those makerspace projects can do and hopefully uh, become inspired to do larger things and build in the criticality. I would agree the... Um can, can robotics solve social problems? Is that the, is that what's the question? No. Okay, good. Yeah, that's not, that's probably not the, uh, the question to answer. The, the idea that community building around technology, I think, is, is an interesting one, but it's also one that is common, you know, barn raisings and, you know, throughout history, people getting together to make stuff. And, you know, robotics and similar tools, robots, 3D printers, makerspaces, uh, the technology centers that I work in, for example, like bringing people together around hard problems. And then I, th I think that in a way the, the robot has done that. In a way we have programmers, we have materials experts, we have, you know, this, this group of people, it's maybe not as diverse as it could be, but a lot of diversity in thought in terms of what goes into, you know, making a group of projects, you know, with the tools. At the, the larger sense, kind of solving other issues and resolving, you know, helping communities build better, there's kind of a top-down approach of thinking about the problem that needs to be solved and deploying the right tool for the job. And these things we're talking about, they're just tools. And so in a situation where there's lots of labor, maybe it's a different tool that gets deployed. In a situation where there's less labor, maybe it's, it's not. But thinking through that kind of critical decision-making about where to deploy which tools and whether it's a systematic deployment or a one-off deployment, I think could start to change the way we think about building community and building communities in places that we might not otherwise consider a robot in the field, for example. And empowerment. Yeah, so I think a tool of empowerment, as much as it is a tool of frustration, let's say, <laughs> but the idea of providing, um, you know, if we're going to train a technology, if, if we're going to build an educational system around ways of doing things, why not try something new? Why repeat traditional ways of, of doing that are, that are imported or exported in kind of arbitrary fashion? I think it's a really interesting point because in, uh, especially in this country it seems to be that people think that if you do social housing, which means it cannot be expensive, that it also has to be ugly and bad, which is kind of a stunning stunning thing to me because I mean it really doesn't matter right like you can make super cheap things that are good and beautiful that are like totally totally easy so it is it is like you know you're not just defeating like an actual problem <laughs> what you what you're trying to defeat is a is a preconceived idea that people are actually very unwilling to revisit which is interesting, right? Like, well, people are actually not willing to look at that. They don't believe you. And it's like, you know, I, I often wonder in this, you know, in, in Europe, like, uh, city governments will, will talk to young architects and help them develop new concepts and new projects. And hence, innovate from the inside out, right? Like, really think of things bottom up. 
in this country, I don't know how you would actually even start. Like, you know, I've tried that in New York. But they, they never ask a question. They come with a problem and they, they kind of tell you how to do it and then you can solve the minute little thing inside of it. So somehow here in this country we're selling ourselves short by not explaining that architects are researchers and innovators. But because somehow there is out there that image that we are designers. And we make things pretty, pretty, but we're not people who make it intelligent and smart and affordable and beautiful, right? And, and that that's applicable for any social layer or for any uh, possible price. And I think that's, I mean, I would love to, to, because, you know, I think robotics is actually a really good way to do this. And you could actually imagine that you could start some sort of social... Um, <laughs> change by just by just starting making these things right like like actually we are working with uh, someone who makes pre prefabricated concrete panels that can have any texture and any shape and any whatever form um, and they're like super thin and super insulated and really beautiful you could make social housing like this but no one is thinking of that or wants it even you know and uh, if they make social housing that's not what they want Right? It's a really funny problem. There's like a gap in understanding that is like a Grand Canyon. There's maybe a question to you. How do we change that? <laughs> I think one of the answers to that is disruption. Like, you know, like disruptive um, practices. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that maybe um, a practice could be recast as a startup or as, or as a consortium with yeah. these parties, you know, because um, I think also what you're describing reminds me a lot of what happens in, say, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, Germany, mm -hmm. where there's also a lot of government um, government partnering with with industry, um, and you know it's a slightly different model here that I'm less familiar with than I am in in Europe. But I think here it, a lot of that really has to happen from industry. So I, I think disruptive startups is a way to do it. Um, there are a lot of things in the building industry that, of course, um, uh, establish, like there's a, a lot of uh, a, a kind of complex union labor um, scenario and all these types of things um, that might make it harder than, say, a technology startup company, like an internet company. Um, but I think there's a lot of room for just initiating uh, things and if if they're creative and and ingenu uh, you know have ingenuity to them, I think they would have legs and they would get somewhere. Yes, yeah, I think so And our students could be doing those. Exactly. Anyone else? I might open it up then for questions from from anyone. Uh, anyone in the audience who has a question. Uh, there's a question from Ferder at the front here, Sandy, too. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Great presentations. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, I, my question is um, I, I'm wondering in maybe not just a program, but in general, I'd be interested in hearing your opinions about a potential other role that technology historically has played also. Um, you used the word disruption at the very end. I was kind of waiting to hear more about those kinds of qualities as well, right? I mean, since I was lecturing about Mary Shelley and Frankenstein to my students today, right? The kind of, the machine as a dis disruptor, I mean, since the days of the Enlightenment and the Romantic uh, era as something that actually makes us rethink nature on many different kind of levels. And I remember in the 90s when we started to sort of like, you know, experiment with the digital um, in a sort of more sort of generative way, th that was still a very important aspect um, to not only, let's say, customize or think of it as a method, but to think of it as something that is, has some kind of built-in criticality that will sort of shake us and make us rethink not only our industry, but potentially 
culture per se. And a lot of this sort of now looking back has a certain level of naivete that I don't think we, we can you know, afford anymore. But I, I do wonder, is there still um, kind of a way of working in, in terms of, let's say, robotics in this particular case, as Rob maybe in a disruptive way, in a productively, constructively disruptive way, obviously, right? Alongside all the other, um, you know, ideas and, and procedures and processes that have been mentioned. Um, is that at all still a part of the conversation? Should Anyone it be? want to answer that? Or is that just the past? Has the arc of history passed by that level of technological computational provocation and we're in the new normal indeed? Ivan Gals, do you want to try to answer that? Mm. Kind of. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but what, what, what your question make, made me think, and something that we, we were discussing also in class today, is the kind of birthing pains of all these technologies and, and the kind of uh, um, growing up together with, with them. And it's kind of unavoidable passing through these different phases of familiarization and sophistication, rejection, all, you know, all this kind of uh, fa family drama, if you like, with them. And uh, a a as Marshall McLuhan used to say, every new medium makes us only aware of the previous one. Like film can only make us aware of the limitations and the possibilities of photography, and, and you know, computers can make us aware of the limitations of text and the possibilities of text. So I think um, we're in that phase still, where we're just like, uh, we're not just uh, mastering uh, the very basics of them anymore, uh, but there's definitely a long way to go in, uh, about the capacities of, of, of all these uh, uh, wondrous um, companions to, to, to the architect. And I think, you know, there, there's not many things I still have faith in, but I do have faith in, in, in um, the architect's capacity to synthesize different uh, things that did not coexist before. And I think by demonstrating that to different, you know, parts of the industry or lawmakers or, you know, uh, city officials, you know, th that's the only way that you can maybe convince and affect change. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I? I don't know that I can to make them jealous. I don't know that I can directly address your question, but it, it just your your question and and thinking back through the past just um, it, it's like it's very clear from our discussions and our presentations, I think that and probably from your experiences with tools that one of the one of the topics that we continue to wrestle with is agency and sources of power. And there's an entire um, thread of thought in this field that suggests that, I think, I think suggests that part of the reason we do this is because we want, we, like architects, we want the power to be able to engage, but then that ignores the entire reality that you showed in the, um, if I were to just take your um, food manufacturing uh, production lines that are highly automated and highly um, dependent upon um, pick and place robotic processes, then it really actually ignores uh, the entire reality of the building materials complex, materials flow, global flow of materials and products, and the entire sort of complexity of a supply chain that we are part of. And so we are constantly, I think, oscillating between these different poles of agency and power, and how disruption happens and where disruption happens also happens, I think, with maybe perceptions and different perceptions of, of like these different power narratives. And so when, when you're talking about um, where expertise lies and where real material expertise lies, we're talking about a form of agency that can come up against our agency and how do we make those relationships because ultimately much of what we saw is trying to move the source of power to a much more collaborative model. But I still think the discourse that we're talking about is oscillating, wobbling, 
between, no, I want it, no, we need it, no, I, it's mine, no, if that makes any sense. I just, it, it, it's, it, there's a constant back and forth, I think, and I wonder if it, if it um, makes this notion of, of, of disruption um, unknowable to some extent. I don't know. But I think it's also, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you talk about power and, and you know, control. Because wh what I think is also really interesting is when you show the presentations, you almost show it like it's linear. But it's completely non-linear, right? Like Jean Prouvé did the most amazing innovative facade panels with all kinds of weird integrative things, or even Jacques Tati's movies, mm -hmm. you know, how they thought about architecture and um, I forget the whatever, the, you know, the, the weird uh, versions of what, what everything could do. I mean, in a way, we, we learn and then we, for like, it seems like a few decades, we need to forget and go back to brick and cement. Uh, like that was the <coughs> best thing we had since uh, God knows how long. But, you know, the fact is that we have had like amazing innovations somewhere in the 30s or even in 1800, no? I mean, I always am quite amazed when people talk about smart geometries like it's new and like in 1830 they thought of Möbius loops and like Riemann surfaces and God knows what, you know, and we architects, we see anything curved and it's slightly irregularly curved and we say it's new. It is pretty shocking how often architects can say new, right? And nothing is new. Everything has been figured out. We just refuse to learn or refuse to re-innovate, we tend to think, and maybe that's the power you're talking about, that we invent the wheel all the time. And it's not like, right, it's happened like a century ago. And, you know, I find sometimes actually the opposite true. You, you read, you find something, I found some amazing tool, and it was 5000 BC. And you're like, my God, we haven't improved at all. They could do that in bronze in like 5000 BC. What did we do in all that time, right? It, it's it really interesting. So innovation is like super non-linear. It well, kind of goes back and forth. Just a quick response, because earlier you were talking about not having slabs and columns, right? And I'm just looking at Masood there. Uh, you know, his whole research is dedicated to kind of reassessing uh, statics. So, you know, at a certain point with the modernist uh, paradigm and this kind of Fordist mentality, mm -hmm. the efficiency and knowledge just left us, right? And now Masood's kind of writing programs to reconstruct a lot of that stuff. So a lot of this technology can be used to reassess. Yeah, of course. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are nostalgic, but it, there are certain things that uh, lost their relevance or just weren't possible that can be possible again and built on him. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions from the audience? There's a couple of hands, three hands I can see there. Maybe we'll start with someone over yeah, here okay. first, over Sandy. Yeah. Thank you all for this talk. Um, it's great. Great to see you all again. Um, it would be fantastic to hear from each of you as distilled as possible your thoughts about with the lens of robotics and autonomous systems, what the goal is on the horizon and past Industry 4.0. What you think, um, past Industry 4.0, what you think the goal is on the horizon in terms of equity, in terms of a new typology, in terms of authorship, um, in terms of global health, and then what you think the goal on the horizon is for the MSD RAS. That was a lot of questions. <laughs> Ed, so do you want to try at least answer one of them? <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that is a lot of questions. I mean, I guess I can jump onto one of them. Um, I mean, uh, one thing that I love, like kind of watching, of course, the birth of the MSD RAS uh, program in the last few years, and specifically also like under Rob's direction and Wink and Andrew and everyone else is exactly the A in the MSD RAS, like the focus on autonomous systems kind of beyond just, let's say, robotic fabrication or whatever other title you want to put into it, because exactly right on the title kind of problematizes uh, a bunch of other nouns that you put into your question, and primarily one of, not only of authorship, but one 
that starts to establish, let's say, a dialogue with the technologies that we're using and the technologies that we're, in fact, inventing and implementing and, um, and using. So I guess, I mean, I'm not going to give you an answer on how does that affect an author, the, the authorship, because it's a much more complex problem and it's not, I wouldn't necessarily position it as just a dialogue with technology. It's, it has multiple other dimensions that are more, um, the interface, of course, social structures, power structures, and ultimately the way that we make collective decisions in uh, design practices. Relative, of course, to the discussion, but it's a much larger discussion. But I just want to point out that the autonomous part of the program is what is really kind of important to crit uh, as a critical element yeah. to this. We're actually going to have to wrap up, but I think we should answer Riley's question a little bit more. Does anyone want to go? Riley, I'll give it a go. So I would love to hear your answer to this question too, but um, I mean, this, in this you asked for individual answers here. So um, I, I think, um, I've actually, I think I, I started my comments with this, that um, beyond robotics and autonomous systems, much of what we're seeking to do, I think, is create what I referred to as before by quoting Howard Davis, create a healthy building culture. And that that is something that Davis wrote about um, more than 20 years ago, um, trying to understand the interaction between the social and the technical and what was essentially happening as waves of technical, technological um, uh, you know, innovation to transform different building traditions and really trying to understand what we're after. And so there's this, um, clearly this, this um, momentum and the work that we do that is trying to seek something else entirely. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that's um, only applicable to MSDRAS. That's something that transcends the, this work that we're talking about here in this field and connects this field to a much, much larger uh, effort. I think we have to end it there. The only thing I would say as well to add to that, Riley, is I don't think a program starts with answers which, or a goal, an explicit goal. Programs start with questions, you know, and if, there's an, if the answer is too easy, it's not worth having a program. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that more, but the the point I'm making is uh, we started with questions. Um, so, uh, we, well, Rick, okay, but um, I was going to have a quick, yeah, go for it. It's a reflection of a person who's basically looking at this program from outside. And this leads to all the toxicity that we points, uh, Billy, you were mentioning about the, um, the collaboration and cross, let's call it cross-disciplinary. I'm not sure you mentioned multidisciplinary is not a model to follow. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I understood that correctly, but um, I'm going to tie that back, this reflection to what Jose said about sketching. I think what is really important and what I can see from this program that can actually come out in the future is that um, this idea of a sketching can actually happen from every new, th new parts of science or pieces of science or, or technology we learn from other disciplines. And, and basically through this collaboration and through the uh, creative lens that each, of, each individual in this group has, we can actually bring it to the next level. One thing that other scientists and other basically collaborators do not have is the creativity and, and, and basically the ingenuity of the innovation that comes from each individual eye in this scene as an artist. That can actually bring it to the next level. And, and design really matters. And that design is basically coming out from every, every individual in this group. And that is the winning, basically, I would say, step towards the future. That's it. Just Thanks, Mr. Um, I think we have to let Richard ask a question, too, before we close. <laughs> Thank you, and, and thanks to everyone. It's been actually fascinating. I, I also wanted to talk about sketching, actually, um, and your comments about sketching and programming being sort of analogous to you in terms of creativity and learning. 
And then I think, you know, Winkum mentioned uh, visiting Gary Technologies and, and Frank Gary, you know, giving her 30 minutes because, uh, you know, it, it didn't matter as much to him, right? Uh, and, and then thinking about, uh, you know, Gary's work and, and the, you know, a, a lot of what's published from that office are the sketches, right? Um, so so in, in some ways it's bypassing the, um, uh, you know, the positive aspects that come out of programming and a kind of technical resolution that is used for creativity. So my, my question is kind of, um, if we accept programming as being analogous to, ske to sketching in terms of your work and with students, how are some ways that you can engage ideas of aesthetics? Uh, in programming, which is largely seen as a kind of very precise technical way of getting at a solution. Do you want to answer that? I'm happy to answer it too, but if you want. Um, I can give it a try. Um, <clears throat> so, well, we can be very creative, obviously, when we program things. Yet, there's two ways to approach the problem. One, if you have a clear problem, you just find the solution, then it's more, perhaps, as you mentioned, it's more technical, it's more goal-oriented, right? But if you're still struggling finding what the right question is, then it's a very open-ended slate to find what you can express to, with it, right? Something that is, something that I find beautiful about programming is that you make tools with computer code and, um, I don't see how different those tools are from a chisel, a pen and paper, like we said before, right? Tools that you can actually provide to other people. And that's one of the beauties, for example, of code. Code is like a book. In a book with math, you can read formulas, and then you can understand it, and then it becomes a new tool that you can apply to your practice. The beauty of code is that code is like an actionable book that you don't have to read that you can just use it right away, right? But what comes with that is that if you do that, then you inherit all the biases, all the opinions, and all the exploration that someone who has created that tool is providing you with. Whether if you like those opinions, it's up to you, and whether if you are happy Photoshop users, that's, that's whatever you choose, right? But if you want to get a little deeper and then be able to come up with your own opinions, that's when you want to learn how to program, to want to create your own tools, and then was, that's when you want to express and share those opinions that come packed in this actionable thing called computer code that other people can, 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 can use. Um, I think also, I see code as having uh, character and behavior when it executes uh, in the same way that a uh, sketch does um, and the way you program it there's so many ways to program it um, so it's it's not like um, you know like with web programming they often talk about content and style but I think when it comes to programming for design and fabrication purposes where there's a creative act involved it's there's no separation style is to do with uh, behavioral character that's embedded within the design intent that whoever is programming is, is putting into that um, so, yeah, uh, I think we're going to have to end it there. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you so much to our amazing panel.